Okay, so just, uh, I guess we'll start now. Um, just a brief announcement that um, in case you haven't seen, all the talks are available on uh, sort of in recorded form on YouTube and they're putting them up really fast. So they're doing a very good job almost after the, you know, less than a day after the talk is done. It's, it's already on YouTube, it's accessible from the page so you can look at all the old talks. And uh, yeah, so today we're entering the, um, the FHE phase of the workshop. So today and tomorrow, we'll see uh, polymorph encryption start from beginning and applications a bit hot area right now. And our first speaker is Ilaria Kilati, who is um, uh, at uh, Leuven and also at Zama in Paris, a startup, FHE startup. And uh, she will give an introduction to sort of the basics of FHE and also uh, a bit about her uh, particular FHE scheme that she's been working on quite a bit. It's practical. So thanks, Ilaria, for being here. Go ahead. Thanks a lot for the introduction and also thanks a lot for all uh, to all the organizers and to everybody that is here. I hope uh, everybody is doing fine with this uh, tough period. So as uh, Vadim already introduced, um, I'm going to talk about uh, FHE in general in the first part of the talk and the TFHE in the second part. Uh, so everybody, if, when you need to ask a question, because maybe it's not clear enough, please write a question in the chat. I will try to take a look to the chat as much, as much as possible. In case I don't see any messages, feel free to, to ping me on that. Uh, so, uh, as I said, the talk is going to be divided into two parts. The first part is only a fully homomorphic encryption, and the second part is going to be TFHE. And for TFHE, I will describe uh, the basic construction, and then I will concentrate a little bit more on gate bootstrapping and on the evaluation of the lookup table. Uh, and I will just give at the end a few implementation results. Okay, so homomorphic encryption. Uh, homomorphic encryption schemes are a family of encryption schemes that allows us to perform computation on uh, ciphertext, on encrypted messages. And in order to perform those computations, we don't need to know the secret or to access the message themselves, just the ciphertext. So in the most generic case, imagine that you have two messages, M1 and M2, and those messages are encrypted. So like in the slides, the encryption is represented by the green box. And what we would like to, to do is to add the homomorphically those two ciphertext or multiply them homomorphically. And we expect as a result a ciphertext encrypting the addition of the two messages or their multiplication. So in the slide, I noted the homomorphic operations and the operation on the plain text in a different way, not only because they might be different spaces, but also because very often the homomorphic operations in here are not exactly as an addition or a multiplication. They might be something more complicated. Um, of course, we would like in more generically um, to uh, evaluate any possible function, not only additions or multiplications, simple additions or multiplications. Uh, we would like to work on different message spaces. So the scheme you're gonna see today and tomorrow during those APHE talks are gonna treat uh, binary messages, uh, approximate messages, inter integer messages and so on. And uh, the scheme could be um, generally in uh, the secret key setting. So the secret key is used to encrypt and to decrypt. But of course, we can also define a public key to encrypt and of course, keep the secret key to decrypt. So in my talk, I will uh, mainly concentrate on secret key version of, uh, of the scheme. Um, so why is homomorphic encryption that interesting in practice? Um, the reason is mainly because of the large amount of application it can allow you to solve. Uh, you think about any possible application that involves sensitive data, uh, homomorphic encryption can potentially help you to solve this, uh, uh, this application. Every time you treat the medical data, biological, genomic, uh, you can do operations in a secure way by using homomorphic encryption. Um, most generally, you can do any kind of outsourced computation. So imagine there is a client and the server and uh, the client want to set, send some data to the server. Um, uh, the, of course, it doesn't want the server to know which kind of data is treating, but thanks to homomorphic encryption, the server could perform the operation, the manipulation, even without knowing which messages is, is uh, treating. And many, many other applications, I just noted in the slide, electronic voting, multi-party computation, but really there are large amount of applications that you could solve. Um, so homomorphic encryption is not uh, 
an extremely new idea. Actually, we heard talking about it in, in 1978 when Rivest, Adleman, and Dertuzos talk about privacy homomorphisms. So their idea was already in 1978 to have a homomorphic encryption scheme in some sort of way as we intended today. Uh, but unfortunately, for more than 30 years, nobody was able to find a, a practical solution, a solution actually, not even practical, just a solution. And the first solution was proposed only in 2009, almost 30 years later, by Gentry, which presented the first fully homomorphic encryption uh, scheme. So when I say fully homomorphic, what I mean is that it's able to evaluate any possible operation, any possible function. So why we needed 30 years to come up with the first fully homomorphic solution? And the question is actually majorly important when you observe that in the meantime, between 1978 and 2009, already we had many, many schemes that were uh, homomorphic. RSA, Algamal, Payet, Goldwasser, Mikali are just examples, but they are partially homomorphic. So when I say partially homomorphic, I mean that they are able to evaluate as instance the addition or the multiplication, but not both operations at the same time. So this is why partially. And after um, those schemes, so we already start seeing even before 2009, some schemes that were more than partially homomorphic, uh, but add some limitations limitation, sorry. Um, uh, very often we are talking about somewhat homomorphic encryption schemes or leveled homomorphic. Uh, those two terms are very often um, not distinguished. I, I like to distinguish them. And I give you an example of a somewhat homomorphic encryption, which is not as instance level. So uh, the example is the scheme proposed in 2005 by Bonego and Nisim. And this scheme uh, is able to perform uh, any amount of additions that you would like, but only one multiplication. So it's not leveled, it's just uh, somewhat. Um, level scheme instead are, are um, able to perform both addition and multiplication, as many as you want potentially, but up to a certain limit. So to explain you why there is this limit, I will try to use um, a, a very nice example, a fully homomorphic encryption scheme that I will present in its level mode, which is uh, DGHV. So DGHV is uh, proposed in 2010 by Van Dyck, Gentry, Alevi, and Van Kutanathan. And uh, the scheme is based on the approximate GCP problem, which is a problem um, uh, based on lattice. Uh, so the scheme, um, I, I'm hiding very uh, many things under the carpet just to give you an idea, uh, but the scheme in its initial form encrypted binary messages. It can be extended to larger message space, but for the sake of this example, we just need binary messages. So um, the scheme uses a, uh, a secret key, sorry, uh, P, uh, that I call P, which is a large odd integer. And in order to encrypt the message M, it just provides an addition between the message M itself, the secret key P multiplied by a large uh, randomness Q, and all of this added by a small randomness R that we call generally noise multiplied by two. Now to decrypt this uh, decipher, the encryption is very easy, to decrypt is easy as well. You just need to reduce modulo P and then to reduce modulo Q, uh, to reduce modulo two, sorry. Um, so the interest of this scheme is that it has homomorphic properties. Um, so imagine that we have two ciphertext, C1 and C2, encrypting two messages M1 and M2 with respect to uh, the same secret key P. What happens if you try to add those ciphertext? Well, you retrieve a new ciphertext encrypting the addition of the two messages. So the addition is an addition modulo two actually. So what you are performing is XOR gate. And if you perform a multiplication uh, in a similar way, you will obtain a ciphertext encrypting the product of the two messages, which in this case correspond to an AND gate. Now, what I would like you to uh, concentrate on is the part that I put in red, uh, the noise. And you can observe in the first case that the noise has double compared to the original quantities. Uh, while in the second case, in the case of the multiplication, the noise has grown even more than that uh, is almost the square um, around the square of the two original noises so of course if you need to perform just uh, a bunch of additions and multiplication this shouldn't be a, a, 
a huge problem since R is chosen way smaller than P. But as long as you start to uh, compute many, many operations, in particular multiplication, which make the noise grow faster, then uh, you might reach a certain limit that prevents you from decrypting in a correct way. So the two options are possible, or you choose your parameters larger enough in order to to evaluate more operation, otherwise uh, you risk to not be able to decrypt at the end. So this is a bit to give you just the idea of why there is a there is a problem in level homomorphic encryption scheme and why uh, where is the problem. So this, of course, is not just a problem that the GHV scheme has. All the schemes that we're going to see during the work this workshop are, are going to have the same problem illustrated in a different way, but there is always this noise problem. So all the homomorphic ciphertext that we know, at least until now, use noisy ciphertext. And this noise needs to be taken into account when we do operations. So since there is this limit, the scheme cannot be fully homomorphic. They cannot evaluate anything. So the, the solution to this problematic given by the noise was found in 2009 by Gentry, which proposed a technique called bootstrapping. And now, I, I don't want to enter too much in the detail of bootstrapping. I just would like to give you the high level idea of what is happening in bootstrapping. So uh, as I said before, uh, we have an homomorphic encryption scheme. And I noted in the slides the, with this uh, blue uh, box. So and uh, we can put any message inside this homomorphic encryption scheme. And now, of course, since he has homomorphic properties, we can use it to evaluate a certain function, a circuit. Uh, and I call this function phi. And so I expect that after the evaluation of phi, the result I'm going to retrieve is an encryption in the blue box of phi of m. So the result of this evaluation. Now, at the beginning of the computation, uh, as I said, there is a little amount of noise that is put in the ciphertext for security reason. And this noise grows when we perform computation. So what I, what I imagine in this slide is that the function phi as a number of computation that is um, large enough, that is large enough, yes, uh, to reach a certain limit that I put with this red line. And this limit means that if you perform even a single operation after this limit, you might risk not to be able to decrypt uh, your message, OK? So now, uh, what is the easiest way to get rid of, the, of, the, of this noise? Uh, well very easily decrypting the ciphertext. Why? Because decrypting makes you retrieve your message and gets completely rid of the noise. But of course, imagine that you're doing this uh, operations on the cloud. Uh, in order to decrypt, you have to give him the secret key. But why giving him the secret key if you encrypt it at the beginning? So what was the reason to encrypt at the beginning? And so you, you don't want to, of course, give the secret key. Uh, another option could be that the cloud sends you back the noisy ciphertext, you decrypt it, and then you send it back with a fresh noise as in the beginning. But this is not always practical, in, in particular when you want to avoid lots of communication between clients and clouds. So the idea that Gentry proposed is still to evaluate a decryption circuit to, to get rid of the noise, but not to do it in clear text. To do it instead in ciphertext, in uh, homomorphic, by evaluating the decryption circuit homomorphically. So the idea is that you put your ciphertext, your noisy ciphertext, so encrypting phi of m, uh, inside a new ciphertext. So you create a second layer of encryption. So your old ciphertext phi of, encrypting phi of m becomes your new message. And nothing changes in the message. So the noise is still at the higher limit, but is not increased. And then, um, since you're encrypting for the first time with the green ciphertext, of course, you're going to have a little bit of noise in uh, the green thermometer. Now, you want to do what you want to do is that you want to open the blue ciphertext inside the green box. And to do this opening, you need a blue key. So the blue key is the secret key of the blue um, encryption scheme. You're not going to give it in clear text. You're going to give it instead encrypted under the green ciphertext in a green box. So now that you have all those ingredients, what you can do is to evaluate uh, homomorphically with respect to the green ciphertext, the decryption circuit of the blue uh, encryption. And the result of this computation, if performed correctly, will be uh, an encryption only with respect to the, to the green encryption scheme of P of M, the message that was hidden inside the blue ciphertext. 
Now, what we would like is that, of course, uh, decryption is um, a set of operations. So since they are homomorphic operation, they will make the noise grow. But what we hope is that after the evaluation of this decryption circuit, in the noise thermometer, there is still enough space to perform at least another homomorphic operation. So the homomorphic properties tells you that if you have an homomorphic encryption scheme that is able to evaluate the decryption circuit and an additional uh, one operation, at least one operation, that your scheme is uh, bootstrappable and you can have a fully homomorphic encryption construction because you can iterate the, the, the bootstrapping, which is this technique, with another operation, bootstrap or perform the operation. Of course, if you can perform more operation between a bootstrapping and the other is always better, but at least one operation is more than enough to have fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, now, a few, um, uh, a few remarks on this slide. I already noticed that there is a little typo. So uh, you can completely ignore this public key in here. As I said, public key or secret key, um, we don't really care. I said I will keep secret key in all this talk and this is a typo. Uh, so just forget about this. And uh, another thing I wanted to say is that this key that we give encrypted with respect to the green uh, box, is uh, so it's an encryption of a secret key and uh, it's going to be called in the rest of the talk a uh, bootstrapping key so it's the key that is needed to perform uh, bootstrapping any questions until now i don't see anything in the q a so i assume i can continue uh okay so uh bootstrapping uh, as you can see is is not a cheap operation. It's, it's actually quite costly in practice. So um, the, the works that were presented after Gentry's, oh, there is a question in the Q&A. Um, so do the two keys need to be different, PK1 and PK2? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, I just put them different just to, um, and also the, the different colors to, um, uh, to show that to, to make a distinction between the, the two schemes, but it's not mandatory that two, the two keys are different. They can be also the, the same keys. In this case, we talk about circular security because the key should be encrypted under the key itself, but it's, uh, it's okay. Does this answer your question? Okay, perfect. Um, okay. Um, so, um, as I said, the bootstrapping is very, very costly. Uh, the works that followed the work by Gentry tried to propose a homomorphic encryption scheme that didn't need to perform bootstrapping that often, or in case we needed to perform bootstrap to try to improve this technique to make it as uh, fast and uh, as possible. Uh, so since bootstrapping is very costly, very often we ask the question is really bootstrapping needed to have uh, to do a homomorphic encryption or not in practice? And the, the answer, at least from my point of view, is uh, no, you don't always need bootstrapping. It really depends on the application you are trying to, uh, to solve. Uh, so in case, as instance, if you know already uh, which function you need to evaluate, um, so you know the depth, the number of operations you want to perform, what you can do is to try to find a set of parameters that is large enough to support this amount of operations. And in this case, we talk about level homomorphic because you don't need to perform any bootstrapping. And this, uh, um, these parameters are sufficient enough to evaluate the function you have in mind. Otherwise, uh, if you're looking for a more flexible solution, more dynamic solution, or if just you don't know which function is going to be evaluated, then you can use the fully homomorphic encryption schemes, so allow bootstrapping. So set the parameters at the beginning, fix your bootstrapping keys and so on. And then with those parameters, with this scheme, you can possibly evaluate any possible function. As you can imagine, of course, these two flavors of homomorphic encryption has pros and cons. In level homomorphic, the evaluation are fast compared to the fully homomorphic encryption solution. But as I said, the depth must be known in advance. While in fully homomorphic encryption, you have slow evaluation, mainly because from times to times you have to evaluate the bootstrapping, but at least you don't have any depth limitations. Okay. Um, yes. So, um, Nowadays, the scheme that we know that are fully homomorphic are mainly uh, based on lattice problems. Um, this is why fully homomorphic encryption is, is in, the, in this workshop. 
so the schemes that we know are based on, uh, at least from, from um, uh, what I remember, are based on three major problems. Approximate GCD, like I show you in, uh, in the DGVH scheme um, before. Uh, we have n true solutions. Um, and the LWE and ring LWE solution. I see that there are more questions. Ah, what is the difference between SHE and LHE schemes? Uh, so as I, I, I give an example with uh, bone agony sim. Uh, so in, uh, it's not often a difference. It's a difference that I'm mainly making in this, uh, in this uh, uh, talk. And of course, if you Many people may not agree, but what I mean with SHE is that they per can perform addition and multiplication uh, and have a limit. Uh, le level homomorphic encryption, you can perform as many as you want, as long as the parameters allow you. So in the case of DGHV, uh, oh, sorry, not DGHV, uh, Bonne Goni Sim, it's more an SHE scheme because you can perform as many additions as you want, but just one multiplication. So it's not level in this sense. Uh, I hope this was okay. Uh, I, I have another question. Do we need to encrypt alpha M into the green box? What is alpha M? And another question is, if a circuit which needs to be homomorphically evaluated, but the input comes from multiple parties, how we should split the private key? Secure multi-party computation can be a candidate. Uh, well, of course, secure multi-party computation is a solution in case you have multiple parties. In case of homomorphic encryption, uh, you have multi-key solutions that uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to talk about them in this, uh, in this, uh, in this talk, but there are multi-key uh, solutions and there is a way to split the key between the participants. Uh, I see that Vadim wants to answer this question. Um, uh, Ilari, I think the question is about, uh... You know your bootstrapping picture, uh, the nice picture. Yes. Slides ago, uh, when. Uh, yes, I'm gonna go back. What is alpha? Uh, phi, actually. So ah, phi. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Um. Uh, so phi doesn't need to be encrypted. I mean, phi if for me are like um um a set of additions, multiplications, operations in general. Uh, it's not necessary to encrypt uh, the operation. Uh, the important thing is to encrypt the data. But there are solutions to. Um, to perform circuit hiding. Um, so maybe you don't hide the operation, but at least the result doesn't give you any information about it. Also, you might choose to, um, to hide the operation by evaluating a generic function as a lookup table. Uh, but yeah, the question is not necessarily. I, I don't need to hide the necessary fee. At least this was not my, my point. So, so Ilaria, I think the question was, uh, you know, because yes. you said uh, you moved from public key to secret key encryption, right? Yes. Uh, it seemed like the bootstrapping operation would need to encrypt, would need to put the blue box inside the blue box. Yes, with... you're right. You're right. right. Uh, I think it was. So this need a public key probably. Well, um, we. So yes, it's a it's a very nice point. Thanks for for uh, for precising it. Um, so in something that I didn't say at the beginning is that I say we just consider a secret key. Um, let's forget about public key. Obtaining a public key encryption scheme in homomorphic encryption is extremely easy starting from a secret key homomorphic encryption scheme. Uh, if you publish a, um, a list of ciphertext encrypting uh, zero and one generally, um, then you can, uh, I think also some scheme you just need an encryption of zero, but um, Whatever. If you just publish a, a list of encryptions of zero, you have a public key in practice, and so uh, you can um, encrypt whatever you like. So yeah, it's a it's a fair point. This should be a public key encryption schema. I it it's a very good point. I don't know if it answered this the question. Hello. Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Uh, it's okay. Uh, so, so I guess one other way to solve this problem is to say that uh, you know mm -hmm. the green box doesn't need to be a random encryption of five fm. It just could be any encryption of five fm. So as long as you can produce like some encryption, could be the identity function in the, you know, in the in the schemes that we. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, cool. cool. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the remark. Okay, uh, I suppose the questions are. Um, that is, yes, okay. Uh, okay, so where I was, uh, here. 
so as I was saying, uh, many lattice problems we can be used to uh, define encryption, homomorphic encryption. In uh, this workshop and in the rest of the presentation, I will only concentrate on uh, LWE and ring LWE based uh, solutions. So very quickly in here, I will give you a list of some of the ring LWE, uh, LWE and ring LWE based uh, schemes. Consider that this list, of course, is not um, a complete list. There is way more in the literature that, uh, that could be included. But of course, for reason of space and, and the time of this uh, uh, talk, I will not be able to, to, to report every, uh, every work. Um, so I, um, I would say that the first uh, homomorphic encryption scheme based on uh, fully homomorphic encryption scheme based on ring LWE is the uh, BGV or BV scheme proposed in 2011 and 2012 by uh, Brakersky, uh, Gentry, and Vaikutanathan. So this is the, the first scheme based uh, homomorphic encryption scheme based on LWE if we don't consider Regev, which was still uh, additive homomorphic. And uh, I will um, I, I put BGV-like scheme because I'm going to give a, a scheme that uh, a list of schemes that are BGV-like. Um, I will try to explain later what I mean with this. So after the BGV construction, uh, there was not uh, later, not more later, uh, there was the BFV construction, which is very similar to the first one. There are some some little differences uh, by Brakersky, Fan, and Verkauteren. And uh, in 2013, we saw a, a different scheme that appeared, GSW. Uh, so the scheme GSW, the construction of GSW is still LWE ring LWE based, but there are uh, some difference with the BGV like schemes. So as instance, in BGV, we have a smaller ciphertext. In GSW, the ciphertexts are, are larger. Uh, the multiplication is done in a different way. In BGV, you um, multiply all the elements of the ciphertext, and then you do a procedure which is called relinearization. While in GSW, you perform directly the multiplication in a special way. And also, uh, the noise growth in the multiplication, at least in the two schema, is a bit different. Generally, in GSW, the noise grows uh, a bit slower compared to BGV. So the schemes are very interesting, both of them. But at the beginning, at least from, uh, from what I felt, uh, is the BGV scheme was um, looked more and more interesting because mainly because of the size of ciphertext, which in GSW were quite large compared to the, to the first uh, uh, family. Um, I would say that GSW then was improved, uh, and uh, a nice improvement was proposed uh, in 2015 by Dukai and Michancho. So they proposed the scheme, which is called FU, and which is GSW based, and that shows that actually, even with GSW, we can perform uh, quite fast operation. And I will give uh, a little bit more detail later in, in this talk. Um, so after FHEW, uh, together with um, uh, Nicola Gama, Maria Georgieva, and Malikaila Zabashen, we proposed the TFHE construction, which initially improved the FHEW scheme and then took a, a little bit a different direction. And the most re recent scheme is again in the BGV-like scheme, um, and it's uh, the scheme HEAN proposed by uh, Cheon, Kim, Kim, and Song in 2017. So, um, those schemes are, um, I just put them in, in those two big families, mainly because of the way the multiplication is performed. But there are, of course, many differences between all of them. Um, as instance, if we take the BGV family, uh, BGV and BFV are encrypting mainly integers, while HEAN is encrypting approximate numbers. And so there are many little differences. But all of this scheme in this list and all their improvements are in practice LWE and ring LWE based construction. And at the end, if we take a look a little bit more closer to all those construction, we see that they are not actually that different as they are expected. And actually is very easy to move uh, from one scheme to another. And this was shown in 2017, in 2019, in the Chimera construction by Buragama, Georgieva, and uh, Jechev. And uh, they build a common framework where they show that TFHE, HEAN, and BFV can be used uh, simultaneously, or at least uh, we can move easily between uh, one and another. Uh, and all of these are, are theoretical, of course, uh, constructions, but all of them are also implemented. 
And we have many implementations that now are available. Uh, here is just a, a list, it's not an exhaustive list again, um, just a bunch of schemes that we have uh, that uh, we can find online. And uh, as instance, HLib was, I think, the first homomorphic encryption scheme that the first homomorphic encryption library, and then many, many others followed. So in this, the rest of the talk, I will concentrate, of course, on the TFHE, as I already announced. Uh, I will start with the theoretical um, description, and then I will give a few details about the implementation. And in the rest of the workshop, you're going to see way more details about all of those uh, construction, or at least the majority of them. Uh, Jung Su is going to talk later about uh, Hian. Jessica is going to talk about uh, few. Um, uh, Yuri is going to talk about Palisade uh, and, and so on. So uh, I'm looking really looking forward to all those talks uh, and to all the details. But for now, I will just concentrate on, uh, on TFHE. Like so it. before I continue, uh, yes, if there are any questions. So yeah, yeah, before you move on, can you go back? Yes, sure. I just wanted to make a remark. So, so you were classifying these schemes based on how the multiplication works. But in some uh -huh. sense, uh, so this GSW like thing, so there's a distinction between uh, so GSW multiplication and then mm -hmm. few and TFHE. It's not that they are using, so multiplication is done differently in few and TFHE. So GSW is, is used yes. in the implementation of bootstrapping. But if uh, yes. we think of this as a classification in terms of how multiplication is performed, few yeah, and few TFHE not... are in a sense, uh, their own category, and uh, there could mm -hmm. be a different uh, line uh, to explore mm -hmm. where GSW multiplication is used mm -hmm. to actually perform uh, the computations, which is in fact uh, how mm -hmm. GSW was presented in that uh, uh, paper. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's- Yeah, uh, I just put them all together because few and TFHE use GSW-like ciphertext. Um, yeah, it's not a, a, a very, like I put many, many things under the carpet. It was like, a, that's why I put them under. Um, uh, no, no, I know, I know. And that's I, also, yes. I just wanted to make this remark because that's also Absolutely, how many yes. papers are also presenting this thing. But in some sense, I think they are just repeating what uh, yeah it was written or said some time. So yeah, I just wanted mm -hmm. to take this as a chance to clarify that. So uh, few and TFHE, they have their own multiplication. GSW is used yes. for bootstrapping. So it's a small. Bit. Yes, 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 absolutely. But yeah, uh, as I said, many things under the carpet. But thanks for the remark. Yes. Uh, any other questions in the meantime? Yes. How TFHE perform multiplication and division supporting or not? So I'm going to I'm going to get a bit more in detail in I, I'm going to start talking about TFHE right now. So just wait a little bit. Um, fully homomorphic encryption level HE schemes are only based on LWE problems. Are there any other construction based on group algebra and other approaches? So uh, as I said before, not only on LWE problems, as I said, there is like uh, n true based schemes and uh, approximate GCD. I show at the beginning that there is a scheme based on approximate GCD. Um, I'm not aware of all the construction existing. Uh, I know that there are many um, line of research trying to um, find solutions that are based on different problems, but uh, I'm, I'm personally not aware or, of anything that has given a remarkable result. But um, uh, if anybody has other comments on this, of course, feel free to. to, to there were many there. attempts. They were just not very successful so far. Yeah. OK, great. <laughs> and the last question, how to handle encrypted loops while and control statements like break and the continuing encryption domain? Um, well. Um, the homomorphic encryption scheme have to be oblivious, which means that every uh, circuit that requires an if condition, a while condition, and so on, needs to be performed in the worst case possible. So if you want to perform an if, as example, you have to evaluate at the same time the if condition and the else condition, and then make a choice between the two of them homomorphically. And uh, similar things can be done for a while. And if you want to break, actually, you can not really break, because breaking a computation will mean like give some um, some information about it. And uh, I don't think this is possible. So really, you evaluate the worst case uh, operations. 
I hope this answers the question. Okay, I emptied the q and I will continue. So I'm going to enter right now in the TFHE, uh, in the description of the TFHE scheme. Um, so as I said, I'll start with the basic construction and then I will talk about the gate bootstrapping, vertical packing and lookup tables, and then just finish with some implementation results. So as I was saying before, TFHE uh, is, starts at the beginning as an improvement of uh, this scheme few proposed by Dukai Michancho, which is a GSW-based construction. But as Daniele um, uh, remarked, uh, there are, of course, differences compared to GSW. Uh, so um, what is very interesting uh, in, the, in the few paper is that um, the paper is able to build um, a fully homomorphic encryption brick. So it's like a really a little brick that you can put together many of those bricks to build any possible circuit. So the brick itself performed a bootstrap and NAND gate. So why a NAND first of all? Because with a NAND gate, you can really build every, every uh, binary gate that you would like. And uh, since um, homomorphic operations have a little problem in noise that grows after every operation, well, the bootstrap NAND gate takes care of this noise by doing a little bootstrap every time the, noise is the, the NAND is performed. So it's really a, a, a brick that is ready to be used to build any possible fully homomorphic encryption construction that you can imagine. Now, the scheme, um, what is very, very interesting is that in uh, Yukami Chancho contribution, uh, the uh, evaluation of this bootstrap navigate, in particular a bootstrapping, is uh, extremely fast. So of course, uh, compared to a NAND uh, clear text gate, the operation is quite slow, but compared to all the previous results in bootstrapping, this was extremely exceptional because the bootstrapping before, I said it was very costly. And when I say very costly, at the beginning was not even thinkable about performing a bootstrapping in practice. Then we, were, uh, we went down to uh, maybe years to perform a bootstrapping, then to weeks, and then to days, and then to minutes. But I think nobody before Dukai Michancho was able to get under the second per bootstrapping. And so it's significantly improved with respect to what happened before. Um, and the bootstrapping keys that are used in the, um, in the construction are a bit large. They, have, uh, they are one gigabyte uh, bootstrapping keys. So in 2016, we were, uh, of course, studying this paper. And uh, together with uh, Nicola, Maria, and Malika, we observed that there was space for improvement. And so we started by building TFHE, which is initially an, an improvement of the gate bootstrapping. I will call it gate bootstrappings from now on. Uh, which is still slow compared to the to before, but uh, improves uh, um, with a uh, factor the the proposition by few. So instead of performing a bootstrapping, a bootstrap NAND gate in uh, less than a second, we perform in less than 0.1 seconds. Uh, and also we reduce the size of the bootstrapping keys from a gigabyte size to a bunch of megabytes. Now when we were improving the, the bootstrapping, the technique that we observe could be used to improve the bootstrapping. Um, we noticed that they could be used also to improve uh, some level constructions. And so in, in the year later, we proposed an extension of the TFHE schema to the level version, uh, where we perform fast computation for small depth circuits. Of course, you're not trying to bootstrap. We propose new technique to evaluate the level of evaluation, to improve level evaluations. And I'm going to show you later in the talk uh, an evaluation of a lookup table. And also, we propose a new bootstrapping, uh, which can be used to help level circuits. So you might think, why is this bootstrapping in the level version? and not in the bootstrap version? Well, because bootstrapping can be also used as a support to level operation. It doesn't really give you, if you don't want, uh, a fully homomorphic encryption scheme can be also used in some sort of way to help level computation. But uh, let's ignore for now this, uh, this little detail. And uh, uh, during this uh, improvement of the level version, we saw that there was still uh, something that could be improved uh, in the bootstrapping itself. And so we reduced the time of the gate bootstrapping down to 30 milliseconds uh, um, as well. So this is a bit the overview of the contribution. Uh, I will now get into the, the details of the scheme. So first question is why TFHE? So FHE, as you can imagine, is for fully homomorphic encryption. The T is for torus. So uh, what we use is the real torus. I have a question. 
Is this little bootstrap done implicitly for each and every NAND gate, or does it have to be called explicitly? No, it's done. Uh, it's done. Um, um, it's done for every NAND gate. At least the construction um, is a NAND gate with the bootstrapping. You don't have to call it explicitly. Is is implicit? Uh, it's not necessary. You can, of course, perform NAND gate in a different way, but this is a, a kind of different construction. In the gate bootstrapping, yes, is implicit. If the NAND operation are bootstrapped, how come is there a need for circuit level bootstrapping? Uh, well, because um, in the gate bootstrapping version, you are performing an operation and the bootstrapping, operation and bootstrapping. Uh, what I what I said before is that we might prefer sometimes to perform leveled operations, um, so not perform the bootstrapping for a long time, and then perform the bootstrapping only when it's needed. So the, the gate bootstrapping version, when we bootstrap every single binary gate and the circuit level bootstrapping version are uh, quite different, are two different approaches, if you want. I'm gonna give more details later if in the talk. I think I emptied the Q&A. Okay, so um, as I said, TFHE because of the torus. Uh, so the torus is just uh, the real numbers, modulo one. Uh, torus, the torus has a very nice Z module structure. Uh, and when I say the Z modules, what I mean is that uh, if we take torus element, we can add them together and there is the, the addition is well defined. So the torus is an abelian group. Uh, we can also perform uh, uh, an external product with integer uh, coefficients. Uh, so if you take uh, a torus element in blue in my slide and an integer element in red and you perform the multiplication, the result is in the torus and the multiplication is well defined. But uh, unfortunately, the torus doesn't have a ring structure. So it means that if you try to multiply uh, two elements in the torus, they are not, um, the multiplication is not, uh, is not well defined. So it's not a ring. And as well as you have this uh, Z module property on the, the torus, you can easily extend it to torus polynomials. So in this uh, talk, I will use the shortcut notation uh, Tn of x as noted in the slide. Uh, and when I say Tn of x, I mean uh, polynomials with coefficient in the torus, so real modulo one, reduce modulo xn plus one. And this, uh, um, this set, as a R module structure, where R is the set of integer uh, polynomials, uh, reduced modulo xn plus one, uh, the ring, sorry. Uh, so as well in here, we can perform addition between torus polynomials, well-defined, external products with uh, uh, integer polynomial, well-defined. But when we try to multiply two torus polynomials, well, the computation is, is not defined. The multiplication is not defined. OK. so. Um, this was just a little bit an introduction. Now, what are the ciphertexts that we use in practice in the TFHE construction? We have three ciphertext types. The first one is the LWE uh, ciphertext. Uh, now, I'm not reintroducing the LWE problem. I, I think it was already well introduced by the speaker before me in the, in the previous days. Of course, if anybody has a question, I will uh, be glad to, to reintroduce LWE, but I don't think it's, there's need. Um, so LWE ciphertext for us encrypt uh, torus messages, so messages uh, in the torus, not necessarily binary messages, they can be different um, uh, message spaces, um, and uh, we use binary keys, uh, binary secret keys. The ciphertext is of the form AB where A is a random vector of torus elements, and B is just equal to the inner product between the secret S and the mask A, plus what we call the phase, which in practice is just your message mu plus some little Gaussian error. Now in the, the figure that I show in the slide, uh, I have the unlocked representation of your ciphertext and the locked presentation. So when I say unlocked, I mean that uh, we can see, of course, the, the the mask, which is uh, public, and we can see the phase. When we see the phase, we of course can easily see what the message is. So I, I cannot write in the slide, but in here you can imagine that this is the torus, so represented like a donut. On the bottom you have zero, in here you have one third, in here you have two thirds, so in here I'm encrypting the message one third. 
and uh, I encrypted by applying the secret key, so producing the quantity B. So as uh, when I decrypt, uh, I will compute B minus AS. I will find the phase. And once I have the phase, I just need to round the phase to the nearest message possible and retrieve the message. So same exact uh, um, uh, talk can be done for the second time of ciphertext, which are the ring LWE ciphertext. It's just a ring extension of LWE. Our messages are not anymore torus messages, but are torus polynomial messages with n coefficients, sorry. Uh, the secret keys are going to still be binary secret keys, but in this case, we see them as uh, polynomials. And the, the ciphertext is not going to be a vector of n plus one element, but just composed by two polynomials, a and b, where a is a random polynomial and b is obtained as well as the product between the secret and the mask plus the error plus the message, and the error is still Gaussian. And then we go to the third ciphertext type, which is the ring GSW ciphertext which instead of encrypting torus messages or torus polynomial, encrypts integer polynomials, uses the same exact secret key as a ring LWE, so a binary polynomial. Uh, and the ciphertext is a little bit different. So the ciphertext are built as an addition between a matrix Z and the message multiplied uh, with this matrix G2. Now, the matrix Z is just a list of ring LWE encryption of zero like the ring LWE encryption that we saw in here, encrypting zero. So it's just uh, imagine it as a matrix. Every line is a ring LWE encryption of zero. Instead, the matrix G2 is called the gadget matrix and is a uh, block diagonal matrix. And in the, the diagonal, you have this little gadget G, which is just a list of powers of two. Uh, I put powers of two just to, to simplify. Generally, we can put something different with respect to two. Generally, a power of two itself. but for simplicity, let's keep it like this. And uh, um, the matrix G, uh, starting from the matrix G, we can define an operation G minus one, which is a decomposition operation with respect to G2. So um, if we apply this decomposition to a torus uh, uh, polynomial, we decompose the torus polynomial into little integer elements. And if we remultiply this decomposition times G2, we retrieve the torus polynomial with decomposed at the beginning. So it's like sort of inverse operation. Okay, uh, so this was lots of formulas. So to give you just a visual idea of the, the objects we are dealing with, I just show you the slide. So to summarize, LWE, ring LWE, ring GSW um, are the ciphertexts we're dealing with. We use LWE, uh, which are n plus one vectors encrypting one torus element. Ring LWE encrypt uh, polynomial elements, so n different torus elements into two polynomials. And in ring GSW, you encrypt an integer polynomial. And the ciphertext is a huge matrix. And uh, you can imagine in here, in every single line of this matrix, you have something that is a ring LWE like ciphertext. Uh, any questions until now? How oh, to end, Rian. Yeah, sorry. How huge? Can you give a sense of how much bigger? Uh... Uh, yes, uh, I, I put the, the numbers at the end. Um, generally, we choose uh, in, in practice in TFHE, we use uh, this ciphertext are two point something kilobytes. No, Those no, no, I mean in terms of matrix ah. size. So. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so in here, generally, you have uh, two times uh, three, four um, uh, rows, so six ish. I would say dep depends on, on your choices, but it can be as distance six rows or eight rows. Sometimes even four if you don't need that much precision. But yes, uh, I don't know if this answered this question. Yeah, it depends yeah, yeah, it on does, it does. Yeah. So it's about, uh, yeah, ah, so okay. four, uh, yeah, it is uh, four rows instead of one. Yeah. Uh, I would say between four and eight, but of course it can, uh, it can variate depending on your parameter choices. Uh, in practice, I think in, uh, in TFHE, uh, in the library, we choose uh, six rows. I, I will double check at the end, but I think- no, That's fine. Rows. It was just to get a, yeah, a ballpark. Yes, yeah. yes, an idea, of course. Perfectly. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so um, 
Yeah, um, I, I just introduced the ciphertext, but I didn't say what operations can we perform on them. Uh, so in uh, in LW and ring LW ciphertext, the linear combinations are allowed, but there is not a native product can be defined on them. Of course, there, is, there are ways to perform the product. If you look at the BGV as instance papers, you can just multiply elements of the, of the ring LW and then relinearize, but there is not what I, what I would call a native multiplication defined. And uh, to go to a more native multiplication, I mean native, um, take it from very far, uh, we have to use GSW ciphertext. And uh, the multiplication is done by using the decomposition of, uh, uh, with respect to the gadget that I described before. So uh, imagine that you have two ring GSW ciphertext, one and, and two. What you do is you decompose with respect to the gadget one of them, and you multiply it with the other by doing a, a normal matrix matrix multiplication. The result is going to be a ring GSW ciphertext, which encrypts the product of the two message uh, of the two messages. Um, what was observed in 2016 uh, by TFHE and also by Brakeski and Perlman the same year is that there exists a different product between uh, that we call the external product and that I will call external product in the rest of the talk, uh, which is a product between a ring GSW, so the, the big matrix, and a ring LWE ciphertext, giving an output a ring LWE ciphertext that encrypts the product of the messages uh, encrypted in, in, in both ciphertexts. So in order to perform this computation, you just decompose with respect to the gadget matrix, this uh, ring uh, LWE. And then you perform a matrix matrix multiplication between the decomposed matrix and, uh, and your ring GSW ciphertext. Um, and uh, um, by observing more closely, we can see that uh, actually the internal product between two ring GSW or ciphertext can be defined by a list of independent ring external products. So it is sufficient to decompose uh, this independent lines of one of the two, in this case D, and then uh, multiply them by C, so perform independent ring uh, uh, external products, and you obtain the same result. So what we observe in TFHE is that in, uh, GS, in, the, in the bootstrapping in few, the operation that were performed during the, the bootstrapping routine were more similar to this, this kind of, uh, of product, so were more internal product-like operations. And the same amount of information that was computed with an external product, internal product, could be computed by using an external product. So this is one of the, uh, the major reasons of the, of the improvement. Um, and uh, starting from this external product, so the second, the second one, this one, we defined also a, a, a gate, a MUX gate, which is in practice an homomorphic multiplexor or selector. Uh, and the MUX gate, so it's, it performs a, a subtraction, an addition, and just an internal product. It's, um, and it adds an input a ring GSW, two ring LWE, so a big matrix and two long vectors, gives you an output a ring LWE. And this ring LWE will encrypt D0 in case C is equal to 0 and D1 in case C is equal to 1. So the, the MUX gate is really largely used in the TFHE construction, both in the bootstrap construction and in the leveled ones. And now I'm going to try to enter more into details, uh, in particular of the bootstrap constructions. I might stop if there are any questions. I wanted to make a brief remark. Uh, yes. So, so the terminology internal external product uh, mm -hmm. is uh, the standard use of these words in uh, mathematics, but uh, I think that it can be a bit confusing uh, for mm -hmm. people looking at this from an implementation point of view, because uh, mm -hmm. what you call the external product mm -hmm. is an operation which is performed internally by the internal product. So if you look at the code, mm -hmm. in some sense, it would have been more natural to call the internal product, call that external and the other one internal. Is, uh, I, I will justify maybe the, 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 the terminology, at least this is uh, why um, we call it this way. 
So, uh, as I said, no, 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 so, 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 ah, yes. so it, it's, yes. sorry, like, it is clear to me why you call it. This ah, okay, way. okay. No, but maybe for the others. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, no. I just wanted to make this clarification for people yes. that are uh, less familiar with the algebra and are looking yes. uh, at the code. Uh, then I think the terminology seems that uh, it is used uh, in the no, it's perfectly clear to me, and the terminology mm -hmm. is mathematically uh, accurate. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. No, but in case, um, I, I, yeah. Okay, thanks for the remark. Um, okay, any other question until here? No, the Q and A is empty. Okay, so um, let's move to the gate bootstrapping application. So um, in it's already six twenty-five. I don't have much time. How long do I have left? I mean, you can take um, you can take some extra time, maybe ten extra minutes if you want. Okay, I will try to fit everything in 10 minutes. Okay, so in the case of gate bootstrapping, uh, please, uh, Vadim, feel free to stop me when, when I'm passing the time, when I'm uh, going too much. Uh, so in the case of, um, there are two ways to do bootstrapping. Of course, you can choose to bootstrap after every gate. So you have the gate bootstrapping uh, option. And as was asked before in one of the question, you, have the, you can also have the circuit bootstrapping. So where you bootstrap after, a larger amount of leveled operations. So um, in the slide that follows, I will just concentrate on the gate bootstrapping. For circuit bootstrapping, I don't have enough time. So in case there are any questions, I will take them uh, offline. So the bootstrapping idea is to um, initially reduce the noise in ciphertext. So imagine that we can see in X-ray a ciphertext, and uh, this is what we see inside. As instance, we are encrypting the message one half. And there is lots of noise, so the message could be anywhere in this red part. And what we would like to give in output is a fresh message, so a message encrypting, um, a ciphertext encrypting a message with less noise. So uh, the, the, um, uh, where the message is on the torus depends, uh, of course, on, on the phase, on the message plus the error, which can be computed by uh, computing B minus 8S. And what we would like to do with the gate bootstrapping is uh, depending on where the message or the phase, if you want, is in the, in the torus, is one of the slices, we would like to give you in output something that, um, that uh, is the output of message. So in case, uh, as instance, we have that the message is in here in this, uh, in this, um, in this slot, then we would like to give you an output, a LWE ciphertext with the message VE plus one with low noise. So in order to do that, we are going to try to play with, the, with this uh, wheel, let's call it wheel. And we're going to try to compute homomorphically the position of the message in the wheel, rotate the wheel of a number of positions corresponding to the message, and extract the ciphertext that correspond to that uh, position. So to do that, we fix initially uh, what we call the accumulator, which is a, a, a vector containing in each uh, coefficient the possible outputs. And then we're going to do a blind rotation, so rotate blindly, because we don't know the secret key, this uh, uh, wheel of a number of positions corresponding to, to phi, the phase. And then we will finally extract uh, the ciphertext corresponding to this phi position. So this is the way the gate bootstrapping is performed. Uh, to give a more schematized idea, this is the, the structure of the gate bootstrapping. Again, the green elements are LWE ciphertext, so you have LWE in input and output. Uh, the accumulator is going to be a ring LWE, and uh, the rotation of the accumulator is going to be computed by using the mute gate I described before. And in order to rotate, the rotation is going to be established according to the bootstrapping key, which is a ring GSW ciphertext encrypting the bits of the secret key. So this is the entire structure. The blind rotation is the most costly part, uh, but with the, the external product, it's, uh, it's quite fast. This is, uh, I'm going to give the timings at the end. Uh, so this is actually anything I wanted to say about the, the, the gate bootstrapping. I'm going to move very quickly to the level construction. And in here, I'm going to present so another way of using the MUX gate. So in here, in the gate bootstrapping, we use it to perform this blind rotation to uh, compute, um, to rotate the accumulator. In the level construction, we're going to use to evaluate the lookup table. 
So um, as I said, LWE encrypt messages on the torus, ring LWE encrypt polynomials. And if we concentrate on ring LWE, we can observe that actually a ring LWE message, a polynomial, is just a large container. And in each uh, coefficient of the container, we have uh, uh, torus messages, different torus messages. Um, now, when we want to evaluate a lookup table, at least in TFHE, we fix the lookup table as something that looks like in the slide, you have binary inputs and uh, uh, torus outputs. So in this case, I have three inputs and two possible outputs. So for the dimension uh, depend on, in, on which kind of lookup table you want to evaluate. And those lookup tables are largely used uh, in crypto. So to evaluate a lookup table, generally what you do is that you take one of the column of the lookup table and uh, you, um, you use your inputs in here, x0, x1, to select the um, output you're looking for. As instance, if you're looking for the output corresponding to zero, you will give an input all zeros in here. And every single uh, level of the mu state are gonna take uh, uh, out from the, from the list the outputs corresponding to one. So it's gonna always keep the outputs corresponding to zero until at the end you rest, re remain with a single output, which is the one you were looking for. Now, in TFHE, those MUX gates are in having input uh, ring LW ciphertext on the sigma part and ring JSW ciphertext on the X part. Sorry. Uh, so, um, of course, in ring LW, as I said, you have a large container. So, putting a single message inside will be a bit of waste of space. So an easy way to improve this technique is instead of putting a single message in your ring LWs to put S elements, all the S outputs correspond to every input and evaluate this uh, MUX tree uh, in order to obtain the output, all the output together in a single path. Now, the point is that in here we have, uh, in, in TFHE at least, we have a bit uh, uh, something around 1000 uh, slots, let's call them slots, uh, a very with abuse of, uh, of uh, terminology. And uh, uh, it's not that easy, or at least it's not that common, to find a, a lookup table that has 1,024 outputs. So in here, even if you pack all your outputs together, most of the time you're going to waste space. So in order to prevent this wasting of space, we're going to try to move the packing from horizontally to vertically. So this packing can be used even if you have a single output. And actually, it's way more easier to fill the packing in vertical way, because to fill it, you just need a 10-bit input, which is quite more common than a 1,024 output. Now, of course, you cannot use the same technique as in here. There is is not that trivial. You have to think about a different solution to use the vertical packing. And this is what we did in TFHE. Now, in this example, imagine that the lookup table outputs were able to fill four ring LWE ciphertext. And the one I'm looking for is uh, exactly in here. So to evaluate this thing, I'm going to try to select uh, at the beginning the block I'm looking for. So the second one, by using a very small CMUX tree, way smaller than the MUX tree I showed you before. And now that I have a single ring LWE output, I want to extract this red guy in here. And to extract him, I'm going to perform a blind rotation as in the same way as I did in the gate bootstrapping proposal by using the different inputs. This blind rotation is going to bring this element in the constant position. And I will just extract the constant position by doing an extraction from ring LWE to LWE. Now, this is way more efficient compared to the previous CMUX evaluation, because in here, in the blind rotation, you don't have a two to the power of D uh, MUX to evaluate, as in the previous CMUX tree. You just have D minus three um, element uh, MUX to evaluate. So it's um, extremely improved with respect to before. Now, of course, you may say, yeah, but I can have a solution or a good lookup tables where I have less inputs and more outputs. Well, there's not a problem. The two techniques, the horizontal packing and the vertical packing can be actually mixed together and you can perform a square packing and mixing the two solutions. Uh, so I'm gonna quick move on the implementation result. It's gonna take me two slides only. Uh, sorry for the, the delay. Um, so 
very quickly, I just wanted to say that all uh, the, the TFHC schema is implemented in C++ and is available on GitHub. On the TFHC library, you have all the bootstrapping, uh, the gate bootstrapping implemented, like all the, the different binary gates. Unfortunately, the circuit bootstrapping and the level operations are not already included in the TFHC library in the official release, but they're already implemented, at least the circuit bootstrapping and some level operation in an experimental repository that is also available on GitHub. So very quickly, the timings. Uh, the gate bootstrapping, as I said at the beginning, took in 2017 30 milliseconds, but we updated the library with new secure parameters and also the, the computers uh, evolved in uh, three years. So right now, depending on your machine, the bootstrapping could take between 10 and 20 milliseconds. And all the binary gates cost the same. And in practice, with this timing, you can evaluate about 70 bootstrap binary gates per second. The circuit bootstrapping is a little bit more costly. I didn't give details, but it can be used to refresh uh, the outputs of a level evaluation. And all the level evaluation, which are mainly MUXs, cost 34 microseconds. And so in practice, just to give you an idea, if we want to evaluate a lookup table as the one I described before, by with 16-bit inputs and 8-bit outputs, this will take you only one second by refreshing the outputs. Um, the size of ciphertext, as I was announcing already before, uh, we have LWEs, which are about 2.5 kilobytes, ring LWEs, 8 kilobytes, and ring JSWE, 48, which is six times the size of ring LWE. And you can encrypt one message in LWE and up to 124 messages in ring LWE and ring JSWE. And uh, I think I'm, I'm finished. Um, so uh, just to conclude, some subsequent work to TFHE. Uh, not only TFHE is implemented for CPU, as in, in the TFHE library, but there are also GPU implementations. Um, QFHE and new FHE are two examples. Uh, TFHE is also used in some neural network application. An example is the paper by Bourse et al. at Crypto 2018 and the TFHE camera solution presented at IDASH. Uh, concerning Adash, um, Miran is going to tell us more about it in the in his talk at the end of the day, um, at least for Europe end of the day. Um, we have also multi-key uh, encryption solution, as I was saying before uh, when I answered one of the questions. Uh, at least multi-key solution based on TFHE, and also TFHE is using some MPC construction. I think uh, probably how is going to give you a bit of details about this onion ring uh, around construction using TFHE. And uh, I think I'm finished. I'm sorry for taking more time than expected. Thanks a lot for your attention. And of course, if you have any additional questions, I'm, uh, I'm here to answer them. Yeah, seven minutes. Thanks a lot, Ilaria. Thank you. There's still one question in there. Yes. Thank you. you. Are you able to perform batching when you do ciphertext multiplication, similar to the batching techniques used in BGV, like schemes to multiply many integers in parallel? Um, no, not in TFHE at least. It's not like, I suppose you're talking about the SIMD um, solutions. Um, not exactly. I mean, the, the batching in TFHE is a bit different, like the, the, the vertical packing and the lookup table evaluation I showed you is the kind of packing we're using. We mainly use the, the packing, uh, the polynomial packing. So every single uh, coefficient of the polynomial is uh, a slot. That's why I was saying abuse, because slots are more like the SIMD slots in general. But no, there are not uh, batching techniques as in, as in BGV. So Ilaria, perhaps one way yes. to describe it is that mm -hmm. the type of batching that you described is different mm -hmm. from BGV because in BGV you're batching the you're packing the inputs and then you can operate yes. on all of them in parallel. While mm -hmm. what you described is a way to pack the outputs. Exactly. The yes, yes, yes. But not it doesn't apply. Yeah, it doesn't give a way to pack the inputs. Yes, exactly. Any other question? Yes. Ah, no. Uh, hi, hi, Larry. I have a, just a high level question. Uh, could hi. you uh, talk a little bit more about the applications of TFHE where uh, 
uh, this type of computations is useful uh, and what are the potential limitations, which types of computations uh, uh, are uh, not easy to do with GFHG. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think there are many possible applications like the neural network application as shown by, uh, by both uh, or uh, at all or by the the CFG Chimera solution and also in the Chimera paper actually uh, there are neural network applications that can be can be shown and the bootstrapping can be used to solve those uh, those applications uh, as I said like in this slide as you see like multi-key every time you have a multi-key solution that you would like to solve we propose at least a multi-key uh, scheme for it um, I think it's Till now, maybe the only multi-key scheme implemented, uh, but I, I might be wrong. At least when he, when he got out, it was the only multi-key scheme implemented in practice. Um, in the MPC uh, computation, you can use a TFHC as a support to, to, uh, to those operations. And uh, yeah, those ones are the one I have in mind right now. Um, everything that is like, uh, as I said, the max computation or a comparison is uh, extremely efficient with TFHE. Um, um, some limitations, maybe we are, we are of course less efficient than maybe a BGV, BFV construction, or even here on, when it comes to packing multiple ciphertext and performing computation in parallel. Uh, but as I said, um, so it's it's um, the scheme has um, feature interesting feature and drawbacks and all the scheme actually has the features and drawbacks and what is nice is actually what will be nice uh, is to actually would be able to take advantage of all of them or all the features together and this actually could be done as shown by Chimera by uh, building bridges between uh, all of them and so taking advantage of one or the other depending on the application. So yeah, I would say this. Thanks for your question, Yuri. Thank you. Uh, what's the main reason TFHE is part of the view? So I have to make a little remark on this. Uh, so few after TFHE came out was already um, improved. Uh, so I, I suppose probably Jessica is gonna give more details about it. Uh, so there are a few reasons about the initial improvement, at least. Um, the external product, uh, it's one reason. In TFHE, we use a dedicated uh, FFT library. Um, let me see, the MUX construction, the, the MUX routine uh, um, brought uh, some, uh, at least the way we express the formula of the, the blind rotation is a bit more efficient compared to at least our initial implementation. Uh, some other things. Uh, well, maybe the fact that we work on 32 and 64 bit integers uh, allows us to perform uh, native operations. So we have a gain also in that. And uh, probably there's another reason I'm missing, but yeah, I think those ones are uh, the major ones. And I also have a question about from Eduardo. Could you provide some estimation about the computational cost of adding TFHE ciphertext? If I understood correctly, you can do addition as integers without using any bootstrapping. Absolutely, yes. It's like uh, the, the cost of an addition between, uh, I don't know, two ring LWE ciphertext is just an addition between uh, all the elements themselves. This is, this is of course, can be performed. I cannot give you, like, I, I don't have timings, but it's, uh, it's extremely fast. It's quite negligible compared to, to the other computation. Way faster, of course, than the external product, which took 34 microseconds. But I don't have an exact timing right now. But, but you can say that essentially encryption, decryption, and addition are the same as LWE and all other schemes. Absolutely. The only yes, difference yes, yes. The, the real difference is the multiplication and bootstrapping. Yes. So yeah, you can just take figures from the other schemes and mm -hmm. it's practically the same code. Yes, exactly. <laughs> OK, so thanks a lot, Ilaria. Now I have two minutes until the next talk. Thank so maybe you. Take five minutes to give Youngsu time to set up. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank and you. thanks everybody again for the attention.